Well, a very warm welcome to our weekly service from the Elim Church in the Home Valley. We're excited that you've joined us here tonight. We pray that tonight, as we continue our series on the armour of God, as we look at the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that you will be encouraged and that you will be blessed and that you will go home all built up in the Lord, ready for the week, ready to, ready to live a life of victory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we pray for our friends and our family who are in need right now. We pray that you would meet them at their point of need. May they know you as Lord. Father, those who are facing emotional turmoil. Lord, Father, may they know you as the Prince of Peace. Father, for those who are facing challenges with their health, Lord, I pray that they would know that you are the Lord, their healer. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Tonight, Lord, may we know the power of your word in our lives. Amen. Thank you, our gal. Good evening. Tonight's verse is Psalm 138, verse 2. And it says this, this is from the Amplified Classic Version. You have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. So you have exalted above all else your name and your word, his name, his word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. So that puts God's word right at the top, really, doesn't it? God has exalted his word above all things. So God's word is so important. God says it's important, so we should say it's important as well. So let's just listen to what scripture, God's word, says about itself, okay? All of these words are taken from scripture or um, um, from um, different translations or from words in um, commentaries and things like that about that particular scripture. I'm not going to read the scripture because for time's sake there would be too many to read. But these are words that are about God's word, from God's word, if you follow me, and about what it accomplishes in our lives. So God's word is living and active, quick and powerful, operative, effective, energised, rousing, encouraging, stirring, emboldening, penetrating, and piercing. It is light, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, revelation, discernment, perception. It is vibrant, God-breathed, correcting, instructing, and equipping. It is eternal, established, sustaining, upholding. It is certain and confirmed, constant and lasting, unshakable, firm, settled, unchanging, permanent, reliable, absolute, faithful, truth, and it is incorruptible. It is health and healing, life and spirit, well-being, vitality, energy, vigour, strength, dynamism and medicine. It is seed, growing, reproducing, bringing forth, creating, extending, increasing, spreading, multiplying, flourishing, expanding, accomplishing, achieving, succeeding, and it is harvest. It is quickening, revitalizing, refreshing, restoring, stimulating, reactivating, regenerating, invigorating, and making alive. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. And in him, in Jesus, God's promises are yes and amen for us right now. Hallelujah. Wow, what a list. Never underestimate the power of God's word in your life. Amen. Let's worship him as we focus on the word tonight.
truth of who you are and what you have done for us has set us free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we are forgiven. Thank you that we have hope, a certain hope that is sure and certain in you. We give glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seat if you haven't already done so. Kathy Groups, Tuesday and Thursday, we look forward to seeing you there, where we'll talk about what we've spoken about, or I've spoken about, in the last four weeks. 
Tonight, we are looking at the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So here it is, the second part of Ephesians 6, 17. To stand firm against the enemy, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, Donald Guthrie, who was a Scottish-born theologian, he died in 1922, 1992, said, the Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, and a balm for every wound. Rob us of our Bible, and our sky has lost its sun. The Bible is very important. We need to know how to wield it and use it in offence against the enemy. John MacArthur, the American preacher, says this, The incredible, matchless, incomparable book is the final weapon, the final element of armour given to the believer in the battle against Satan. And the sad fact is that so many Christians do not really know how to use it. We fall victim to Satan because of an an, an ineptness with the sword. So we're going to look at that, how we can wield the word of God and no victory against the enemy. That's what we're going to get up to or where we're going to conclude or end up tonight. But before we get there, I want to remind ourselves, remind you what the word of God is, what the Bible says about itself. So the Bible claims that it is infallible. That means that it is without error in total, that the sum of it makes no mistakes, that it is faultless, flawless, without blemish. Psalm 19.7 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect. In its total, it is infallible. The word is inerrant, inerrant. And that means that there is no error in it. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says that every word of God is flawless. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the translators have translated it always accurately or printed it properly. Um, There's a famous uh, 1631 version of the authorised version, a printed copy of, uh, made by Robert Barker and Martin Lucas. And Uh, where it got to the Ten Commandments and it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, Um, they made a printing error. And their Bible read, thou shalt commit adultery. Now, obviously, that error wasn't right. (laughs) Someone gave me a a newspaper article the other week, in fact, uh, which was entitled, The Bible Has Never Been Properly Translated into English. And it was an interesting article. It, it piqued my attention and I read it and basically uh, what the article did, it went through to give some examples of where uh, in the, uh, our Bibles words had been added and uh, that weren't in the original Greek or in the original Hebrew. And uh, the argument was that it was, hadn't been properly translated. Now, I think it all comes down to what we mean by the word properly, because If I was to say, has the Bible been literally translated word for word as it appears in the Greek language? Well, the answer to that is no. For a start, the Greek grammar is all different to ours. So if we were to translate it word for word, it would read in a bit of a jumbled way to which we wouldn't understand. And also the translators have translated words uh, to give them meaning. To help us to understand what they're on about. And the classic example, perhaps, is what uh, I was talking about the other week when we were talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And we talked about how the uh, breastplate of righteousness protects, or the breastplate protects the, the inward parts, the inward organs here. And I said that in Greek understanding, that was the seat of emotions. So when the Bible translates uh, in, uh, in uh, where is the, transla- the uh, reference, Mark 6, 13, when the Bible translates that Jesus was moved with compassion, it doesn't actually use the word compassion. It, you, it says Jesus was moved in his inward parts. So I guess somebody might argue that to properly translate it, the Bible ought to translate it that Jesus was moved in his inward parts, but 
to the translator, that makes no sense whatsoever. So to give it meaning and perhaps given a more accurate um, understanding of what is written, they translate it, Jesus was moved with compassion. Some people might ask what the best translation is because uh, sometimes you might have a very liberal translation or very loose translation or quite an accurate translation. Um, I quite like, I, 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 for many years I liked the NIV. I've fallen out of uh, love with the NIV and more in love with the, uh, the King James Version now. Perhaps because it uses words that make you think. So here's an example from Romans 7, uh, 8, where Paul says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of uh, concupiscence. Can't even say the word, let alone understand it. And you might think to yourself as you read that, Well, I don't for the life of me understand what Paul is talking about. Well, that makes you stop and think. It makes you stop and think and look the word up in the dictionary. It means uh, a, a, an unwelcome, passionate, lustful desire. So the good old King James uses sort of uh, good old language, perhaps that we don't use nowadays, but it makes you stop and think rather than just skirting very quickly over uh, reading the word. We can often use many different Bible versions to help us to understand the sense of what is being said. Now, coming back to the word is inerrant, it doesn't mean because we don't understand it, it's wrong. One day we will understand it fully. And when we think about it, I guess that there are many scripture verses that you can say today that in the past you didn't understand. Maybe for years there were verses that that didn't quite make sense. But now the Holy Spirit has brought revelation to you. You now understand the truth of what those things mean. In fact, it was uh, Mark Twain who famously said, most people are bothered by the passages, passages of Scripture they do not understand. But the passages that bother me are the passages that I do understand. That was Mark Twain. And I guess when we come to understanding, when we say that the Bible is inerrant, uh, inerrant, if there are passages that we don't understand, well, we've just got to to trust God that what God says is true. And even if we don't understand it, we just trust that one day we will understand it. The Bible is complete. Uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says this, If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the place described in this scroll. And if anyone takes a word away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and the holy city. In other words, you can't take away from it and you can't add to it. It is already complete. It's not as if I was walking, you know, might be walking up on Castle Hill. Castle Hill. And uh, one evening, and it was pouring with rain, and there's suddenly a thunderstorm, and I got zapped by lightning, and an angel appeared to me and said, it's God speaking to you, write this down quick. Uh, and Ian, this is, what you, this, is the, this is the word of God uh, that now has to be written down for the church worldwide or whatever. Um, no, what we have already is everything that we need. And we shouldn't be saying, oh, well, that doesn't matter. We can, we can cut that out either. Because it's uncomfortable to listen to or read. The Bible is authoritative. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2, it's that we read, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. When God speaks, everyone better listen. That's what it means when it says it's authoritative. God's word has authority. It is the final word on a matter. If God says it, he says it. It is more authoritative than the word of man. It is more authoritative than the word of a scientist. So what God says about creation is true. I said to you the other week about how uh, these scientists have Uh, starting to ask questions about Darwin's theory of evolution and saying to themselves, hey, um, this doesn't add up. We need to rethink it. This is scientists saying this. After all these years, they realise that it's not right. But then in the news this week, 
there's been something about the Big Bang theory uh, and, and saying that is now questionable. Um, so the Big Bang theory essentially states that the universe began some 14 billion years ago in an incredibly hot and dense state and has been expanding ever since. However, the characteristics of the galaxies that are furthest away should be huge and contain a red shirt to their light. But what the James Webb Telescope has discovered is that those galaxies are the complete opposite. They've looked through this telescope and not found what they thought they should find, but they've found the opposite. An astronomer at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, uh, one Alison Patrick, spoke about this new evidence with great panic. According to Patrick, right now I find myself lying awake at three in the morning and wondering everything I've done is wrong. Well, yes, I'm sorry. You should have read the Bible. That would have told you. If you're going to believe a scientist, you've got to ask yourself, which scientist are you going to believe? And can you be sure that they won't one day change their mind? But what God says is true. God doesn't change his mind. God's word is the final authority. We might not fully understand it. We might not fully understand creation and how things just happened when God said, God, let there be light. But we believe it by faith. And one day we will understand it. The Bible is sufficient. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 it says that it is sufficient to make you wise unto salvation. Uh, it is sufficient to make you perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. This book can bring you to salvation and brings you to perfection. There is nothing else that is needful. The Word of God. Now, um, remember the mutiny on the bounty, the I was going to say the film, The Mutiny on the Bounty, but the, the story of The Mutiny on the Bounty, HMS Bounty, and all these people decided that they were going to have a mutiny, and uh, they ended up on Pitcairn Island. Now, some of these people uh, were subsequently uh, brought to trial. Some of them were murdered uh, by the natives. Some of them were uh, just died. Ten years later... The history tells us that there, were only, um, there was only John Adams left with 11 women and 23 children. Ten years later. And ten years later, when they were going through all the chests of stuff that they had retrieved from the bounty and that still had on Pitcairn Island, someone found a Bible. Someone picked the Bible up and they started reading it and subsequently John Adams, the uh, 11 women and 23 children, all got saved. Praise God. Because the word is all that we need for salvation. It brings us to salvation. And apparently even on Pitcairn Island today, the majority of, believe, majority of the population are believers today because of that one Bible that was found at the bottom of the chest. The Bible is effective. It speaks. When it speaks, things happen. The Bible changes things. The word of God works. It brings transformation. Isaiah 55 says this, So, my, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void, but shall accomplish what I please. You see, the word of God is living, it's active, it accomplishes what God uh, wishes it to please. Um, and there's, there's oh, I say an amusing story, but an interesting story uh, from the Hellfire Club uh, in Bristol in the 18th century. Uh, and the sole purpose of the Hellfire Club was to ridicule George Whitfield. So this a uh, group of people would follow George Whitfield around and they, they'd get up and they'd mimic him. I don't know what they'd do, whether they'd, they'd, they'd start um, mimicking his character and uh, the way that he spoke and uh, poking fun at him. And on one occasion, this chap called Mr Thorpe stood up to impersonate him. Now, I don't, understand, I don't know the exact words that he... He, he used, but let's just say, for example, he stood up impersonating George Whitfield. And he says, the blood of Jesus 
can set you free. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Repent and believe and you shall be saved. By grace you have been been saved, not by works so that no one can boast. And this not even of yourselves, this is the gift of God. And as Mr. Thorpe was impersonating George Whitfield, ridiculing him and poking fun out of him, and everybody else was laughing, suddenly the word of God had an effect on this Mr. Thorpe, and he got saved. And he became a Christian leader. Because the word is powerful, the word is effective, the word spoken even if spoken by an unbeliever, he's still the word of God. The word of God is divine. That the scripture did not come from any private interpretation, it came not from the will of man, but from holy men of God, as God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God spoke the word, inspired the word of God through the writers of the Old and New Testaments. It's not inspired in the way that perhaps um, Shakespeare was inspired or somebody was in the cafe and they were talking about Penny Lane, Paul McCartney song. Is it a Paul McCartney song? I think it is the Beatles anyway. And uh, they were saying how inspired the words of that particular song are. Uh, Maybe that they well are. But that's not what it means when it says that the Bible is inspired. Every word is deliberate and there for a purpose and chosen carefully by the Holy Spirit. And as the men of God wrote letters, as the men of God wrote the Gospels, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them the right words, the exact way to express things. Now listen, uh, a book that is infallible, inerrant, complete, authoritative, sufficient, effective and divine is a book that ought to be cherished. What does the Bible do for you? What does the Bible offer you? What resources does it bring you? Well, let me just offer you a few. It is the source of truth. John 17 says, 17 says, 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. So the Bible is the truth about life, death, time, eternity, the truth about heaven and hell, the truth about right and wrong, the truth about men and women, amen, the truth about old people and young people, the truth about children, the truth about society. The truth about every relationship between God and man, every relationship between man and man, and every relationship between man and creation. The truth about everything that is needful. Truth. If we want to find out what the truth is, we look to the word of God. Now, you might not agree with me, but uh, this is is one of my pet things. I'm sorry, so I'll give me grace for a few moments. Often I have, over the years, none of you here, uh, by the way, over the years... uh, People say to me with their children, well, they've just got to discover for themselves what wrong is, what, what wrong is. You know, um, uh, we've tried to tell them what is right, but we just need to let them go into the world and discover that drugs are wrong, that getting drunk is wrong, that having sex with anybody that you like is wrong. They just need to learn it for themselves. Well, I understand that's a good worldly attitude, but we do not find out what is... Because they say, well, when they, when they, when they realise that it doesn't work, they'll know what is right. No. We do not find out what is right by experiencing what is wrong. We know what is wrong by knowing that which is right. And the Bible tells us that which is right. We haven't got to let our kids go astray so that they can discover what's right. The Bible tells them straight away. 
The Bible is the source of happiness. We see the world around us chasing happiness like mad, just furiously chasing happiness. And the simplicity of the scripture is Proverbs 8.34. It says, happy is the man who hears me. Luke 8.28, happy are those who hear the word of God and obey it. If you want to be happy, if you want to be content... The Word of God is your source. The Bible is the source of guidance. Psalm 119, 105. The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible is a source of encouragement for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures, so through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So we've got the encouragement of the scriptures because when we look at what God did in the past, when we look at what God did with David and Goliath, what, when we look back at what God did with Gideon, when we look back with God, look back at what God did when He delivered Moses and the Israelites uh, from the Egyptians and opened the Red Sea, when we looked at when we look at all these impossible situations, when we see how he protected Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, when we see how he, he, he worked in the lives of uh, 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 the, the people in the scripture, we are encouraged, we learn that God is faithful, that with God nothing is impossible and that God is on our side and that he won't let us down. We're encouraged. The Bible is the source of perfection. 2 Timothy 3.16, that the man of God may be perfect. Um, the Bible is the source of so many things. So the word of God never has an error, never makes mistakes, is always sufficient and complete, authoritative and effective, can bring to your life truth and happiness and power and guidance and encouragement and perfection. One last thing which we'll conclude with tonight, God's word is the source of victory over the enemy. And that's where we arrive at Ephesians 6.17. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that gives us the weapon against our enemy. There are two types of swords that are mentioned in the Bible, two types of swords that were um, uh, used at the time. We have the broadsword. So that's what we mentioned last week when we were talking about the helmet of salvation. It was about a yard long and it was wielded very much like a baseball uh, uh, bat and you just... And if you were in its way, it would split your skull uh, in two if you didn't have a helmet on, if you didn't have that protection. It was called the broadsword. And... Uh, uh, took broad strokes, slashing wherever, who, whatever got it in its way. Now, the other sword mentioned here is what is called a micra, a shorter two-edged sword used to cut and thrust, about 18 or 19 inches long. Um, it was the kind of sword that Peter used when he cut off Malchus's ear in the garden. Um, the smaller sword was used with skill. It was cut and thrust, used with precision. So we have the broad sword, but we have the micra, cut and thrust, used with precision. Two Greek words that are translated word in our English Bibles, um, and the two types of Roman sword help us to understand the difference between these two swords. The first Greek word is the word logos which means general revelation of God. Jesus is described as the Word of God, the Logos of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Logos, a word frequently used by Jesus to refer to the Scriptures as a whole. And in Acts 6.3, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. So the word Logos is a word, a broad word, for the word, a broad word. And we can, for illustrative purposes, compare Logos, the general revelation of God, to the broadsword. It refers to all God's word. It is broad in definition. 
The second Greek word, translated word in our English Bibles, is rhema. And this is the word that is used, uh, uh, that, that I want to home in here. This is not general revelation, but specific revelation. It's not the Bible as a whole, but a specific word, a Bible verse or a promise. Vine's Dictionary says this, an individual scripture the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance in times of need, a specific word, promise, or verse. So when Paul tells us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it is the Rema word of God, the word of God involving applying specific principles to specific circumstances. It is not a swing of the broadsword, it is a thrust with surgical precision. Rhema, a targeted, specific word of God. So when we look at the example of Jesus, when he was tempted by the enemy uh, in the wilderness, when the enemy comes against him and, and says, OK, um, uh, I want you to turn this, you're hungry, Jesus, turn this bread into, turn, no, turn this stone into bread. And Jesus did not come back with a broad word, oh, God is love, which is a broad statement. It's a true statement, but it's a very broad statement. He came back with a specific word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Surgical precision that address the specific need. Then throw yourself down from the temple. You shall not put your, the Lord your God to the test. Not a broad reply, but a specific scripture that addresses the specific situation. All these kingdoms I will give you if you fall down and worship me. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus did not flounder and did not throw out words indiscriminately. He used, his, he used specific passages to defend against every specific temptation. Every time the enemy came against him, he used a specific verse of scripture from Deuteronomy. Word for word, by the way, as well. Jesus didn't say, well, isn't there a scripture somewhere in the Bible? Didn't I read it the other day? Is it, um, is it man shall not live by... Uh, bre- what was it? I'll have to get my phone out and have a look. Now, Jesus didn't have a phone, didn't have a concordance, but he knew it. He knew the word of God and he used it to ward off Satan's temptations. We should do the same. When the enemy says, you're not forgiven, are you? A broad sword would be, God is love. A surgical sword that would answer and cut and thrust and said, If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9, by the way. And then the enemy might come against us and say, Ah, you're never going to be healed. You're always going to be sick. You're always going to be miserable. A broad answer would be, God is love but a surgical, precise, cut and thrust, crust answer, cut, cut and thrust answer is, by his wounds, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. He went into all the villages and healed all those that were sick. You're never going to have enough. Broad answer, God is love. Surgical, precise answer. But my God is able to supply my needs according to his riches in glory 
Now, I've not quoted that off the top of my head quite correctly, have I? But you, you understand what I'm saying. A precision verse specific for your need. Now, Joshua, I'm not going to carry on with what the... I'm going to miss some, a few slides here. I want to stop here and, 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 and talk to us and make this practical. Because what is the situation, what is the challenge, challenge that you are facing right now? Maybe it's with your health, maybe it's with your, with your emotions, maybe with it's, it's with your financial situation, maybe it's with relationships, maybe it's with your job, maybe it's with your family, maybe it's some other situation. You name it, God has the answer. You name it, there is a verse of scripture. More than just God is love, but a surgical, precise answer. We need to stand upon the word of God. Now, and we need to have that rhema word from God. Now, how are we going to do that? How, is God going to, by the Holy Spirit, drop that word into our, into our spirits? Yes. But that's going to be much easier if we are familiar with the word in the first place. Because God cannot bring a word of remembrance to, your, to you unless you've read it in the first place. You follow me? You can't remember something you've not read. So this is what I say is, is the importance of the word is that we read it. There's some Bible study notes out the back if you want some Bible study notes. If you don't, you say, sometimes we are over, overwhelmed by the fact that sometimes, oh, I've got to read a whole chapter. I can't, you know, it's, it's too much for me to read a whole chapter. Too much, too much. Start reading by, start reading a sentence. A verse. If a verse is too much, start reading a couple of, uh, half a verse. But read the word and allow the word to transform you so that in, when the enemy comes against you, the Holy Spirit can remind you of what you've already read. Study the word is another one. Memorize the word. Your word I've treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I'm going to conclude right now. Thank you for listening. But I want us just in a, a moment of silence just to wait upon the Lord and say to him Lord this is my situation give me a word to stand upon in faith give me a word that I can claim to stand against the enemy give me a word that I can use as a weapon that will um, neutralize his attack against me Let's do that right now as we just do that. Maybe it's a word that just says, uh, just, just, just where, where the Holy Spirit reminds you of a, a verse that I've already said, that by grace you've been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, sometimes the enemy comes against us with, with those words that say we've got to do something to be saved, but it's by grace. Thank you, Lord. By his stripes, I am healed. God will meet my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, as you give us that rhema word to stand against the enemy. Amen. Amen. Now you might say to yourself, well, God doesn't speak to me. God is never going to talk to me. Well, give him chance. Hallelujah. Start looking at the word. There's nothing wrong with, with looking at a concordance, looking at the internet and, 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 and trying to, to search for a, to, to a verse. Nothing wrong with that. When the Holy Spirit makes that verse alive to you, you know that that's the word that God has given you to stand against the enemy with. Amen. Praise God. We're going to sing one last song. Jesus, you're my firm foundation.
Amen. Chris is going to just share something. He's going to come to the front here so the camera can uh, find him. And also, I'm just going to stand here so that the mic will pick him up. Thank you. Yeah, just all the way through the prayers and worship tonight, I had this burning on me that I had to say something. And all through the sermon, it's fitted in with everything he had said. And I just believe that there's somebody, maybe here, maybe out there tonight, whose life is in a total and utter mess. Mm -hmm. They can't see a way out. They think they've messed it all up and there's nothing you can do about it. And you're lying awake at night and you're tossing and turning and you're trying to think of solutions and everything you think of fails. And you're getting up in the morning and all day, all you're doing is thinking about the problem. You're trying to find a solution to it and everything you think of makes it worse rather than makes it better and all I want to say to whoever that is God's word says be still and know I am God Mm -hmm. it's time to stop digging and start praying when you get in that hole stop trying to find your own way out and let God help you look to his word look to his promises pray to him to help you and he won't let you down he'll never leave you He'll never forsake you. You won't get in a hole that's so deep that God can't get you out. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Okay, so someone's just got up in the congregation right now and said that (laughs) when I was talking about allowing God to um, speak to them with a rhema word, they had got that word, be still and know that I am God. Thank you, Jesus. What an encouragement God is, isn't he? And I'm sure that he's going to encourage you with a word for your situation so that you can be victorious over the enemy this week. Amen. Praise God. Don't forget that it's home groups this week. We're meeting at the cafe this Tuesday and Thursday at 7 o'clock. Um, if you want to contact me, 01484 323 978. Uh, my mobile number for text is 0747 277 You can email me at info at hvelib.org.uk. Um, before you go, uh, by the way, we're going to make ourselves available for you uh, if you want prayer. We'll be up here. We'll pray for you. Other people will come around and gather, I'm sure, if you make your way forward and pray with you as well. Uh, we love you. God loves you. God's on your side. We're blessed. We're blessed by the best. See you next week. Amen. Amen.